It is my honor today to introduce the 2021 Elsie Hellman Speaker. Having given that lecture myself, as a founding board member of Less Cancer, as a subsequent chairman, and then now as chair emeritus, as a practicing gastroenterologist, and as a state senator in New Hampshire, I share with today's speaker a deep-rooted belief that science and evidence-based research, especially in the area of prevention, is critical to the future of our healthcare system. It's the low-hanging fruit in how we approach cancer prevention. Her work as governor and also as uh, the ninth administrator of the EPA has been critical in decreasing sulfur and ozone emissions, protecting open space, and also preserving watersheds, both in New Jersey and throughout the country. It is a deep honor for me to today recognize and introduce our 2021 Elsie Hellman Speaker, Governor Christy Todd Whitman. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. First of all, let me offer my thanks to each and every one of you for your involvement in this crucial area. Science and medicine have been challenged as never before in this era of a pandemic where hospitals get overwhelmed with emergency cases of COVID and they still have to deal with their regular duties and people with other emergencies that come in every day. So thank you, my hat is off to you. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to all that you do, however you're involved through science, through actual hands on the practice of medicine behind the scenes. Everyone who's involved deserves kudos from all of us who are not and depend on you all. I was asked to speak today about the importance of science and the environment and how those two things interrelate. Uh, certainly having lost a sister, a sister-in-law and a cousin to cancer, I am particularly sensitive to that insidious disease. But in general, we have learned over time the importance of good, clear, scientific research as it affects our daily lives. We learned a lot about arsenic. We've learned about what it does to human health and how it, the developing brain is impacted by it. And the Environmental Protection Agency has stood up and created guidelines and standards and up until recently enforced those uh, very assiduously. I believe in a new administration, we're going to get that as well again, and finally get back to enforcement of our environmental regulations. We know that air pollution, PM 2.5, has a direct effect on people's health, particularly people who are compromised uh, with lungs disease or children. We don't know what causes asthma, but we do know what can trigger attack or an exacerbate an attack. And asthma is still the most universal cause of missed school days in the country, over 10 million missed school days. And that's because of particulate matter, PM 2.5. We enjoy our sunsets when they become uh, more colorful, but unfortunately that means there's more pollution. And that means that it becomes increasingly important to continue our effort to ensure that we have pure science, that science is held up as being as important as it is. With every decision, every regulation that's put in place by the agency, the Environmental Protection Agency, or any part of the federal or state government, it's got to be based on science. There has got to be, there are always going to be policy questions that come in and decisions that are made on policy, but they should not be made on politics, and they all should be based on pure science. We've seen a, a problem with this administration where in the Environmental Protection Agency alone, you've lost some, we've lost some 900 scientists. And when they have been replaced, to the extent they've been replaced, it's been largely from um, the industries that the agency regulates. And that's not a way that we should be going. It doesn't help us in this era of new things coming at us. I would argue for one, while no credible scientist will say this absolutely, you do hear scientists talking about the fact that as the climate warms, environment changes, ecosystems change, pathogens change as they come in contact with one another. And as humans come in contact with animals that with which we have never come in contact before, and we see their impact, I mean, it's easiest to see on the crops and in the vineyards where you have the um, 
various pests that are coming in and destroying whole crops. But we also see it in something like a pandemic. Uh, I would relate this back to climate change and the need for science to be informing our decisions as to how we go forward to address this issue. I learned an early lesson on the importance of environment and climate change when I learned about the uh, horseshoe crab. I never realized that it's the blood of the horseshoe crab that so many uh, companies depend on still uh, as a, something against which they test the purity of their various drugs. And yet as a governor, I faced the issue of the horseshoe crab being uh, eggs, being a prime source of replenishment for the uh, birds on the migratory path coming up from South America who stop at our beaches on Cape May and replenish themselves with the eggs at the same time that the elvers who fish for eels we were then used as bait for the fishermen, and, and fishing is a, an enormous part of our economy, uh, commercial and recreational fishing off the New Jersey coast. And you have to balance the needs of each of those. They use the eggs to catch the eels, to, they use to catch the fish. And we had to put some restrictions on those, but it shows just how closely we are related to our natural environment. And we don't know that without science. We don't appreciate that without an understanding of it. Um, I read that Bill Bryson's book on the body, which I found riveting. And I hope more people do, because again, there are so many lessons put in a way that, that people can understand. And that's perhaps the biggest failure that I would say of the scientific community. It's learning how to talk in people talk. Um, all of you are so vested in what you do you understand it so deeply that it's sometimes difficult to put into words so that people like me can understand. And yet we have to be able to communicate to the average person that they can have confidence in science, that science is based on fact. Now the challenge is that science is ever changing and we know more today than we knew a month ago, knew a year ago, knew 10 years ago. And that's all for the good but it sometimes calls into question decisions that were made back then based on what we now know to be incomplete science. I won't say faulty, it wasn't faulty. It was right at the time, but it was incomplete. And again, that's a challenge of the scientific community in the medical community in being able to communicate to people that no one was acting with malfeasance, but we learn more every day. And because science isn't exact, it's an enormous challenge to the policymakers. When we were looking at the standard of arsenic in water, my scientists were telling me that anywhere from zero to 25 parts per billion was an acceptable amount. Now, every time you raise that by a percentage point, it impacts a whole new part of the world, a whole bunch of new uh, utilities that are providing water and has a real impact on cost of purveyors and purveying that water. And so, it's hard to know when you have that kind of a variety. I could, somebody told me 10 parts was the correct number and people would live forever on that. That's pretty easy. I can make that call. But to tell them, give me a range makes it much more of a challenge. And that's where policy has to come in. That's the policy decision. It's not political, it's policy. Now that's where you need the help of the scientists to say, this is what we know. They have to be upfront about it. When we face the anthrax attacks, back in 2001, two, uh, I guess it was one because we were also dealing with 9-11 at that time at EPA. When I went to the CDC to ask them what was an acceptable amount of, our, of anthrax that, to which someone could be exposed safely, they didn't have a number. And so I had to make the decision on my own, which was zero because we were cleaning up a hard office building, which was an enormous undertaking at the time. So we need to work in a partnership. You need to work with the regulators, you need to work with the government officials, understanding that they have some decisions to make based on the information you're giving them that are going to be difficult. And they're not always going to come to a hard and fast one in a place where you might be most comfortable. But you have to back them up when you think they're doing the right thing, when you think they are, in fact, doing using the best knowledge you're giving them at the time, but allowing some leeway for the other, implica other impacts. I remember at EPA, there was a study, I wasn't part of the agency at the time, where they had gone into a community in the Southwest where the purveyor of the water in that community was 
providing water that was 90 parts per billion. Um, the national standard at that time was 50. And so the EPA went in and said, I'm sorry, you got to clean this up. It's got to get down to 50. Well, what happened was the utility said, we can't do that. We're out of here. It's too expensive. And that left the community with just a few choices. They could sell their homes, they could dig wells, or they could buy bottled water. Most of them chose to dig wells. And when the agency went back in to test, they found the naturally occurring arsenic in the water there was 100 parts. So we hadn't done anything for human health. And yet we would made people spend lots of money to dig their wells and put a company out of business. That's not to say that the standard shouldn't have been lowered way below the 90 that people were getting, but we might have been a little more sensitive to how far to lower it, how fast, uh, in order to ensure that we did help human beings and we did improve their health, while at the same time not putting this out of their economic reach. So there are all these balances that uh, the policymakers have to make, but without good science and without public confidence that science is important, we lose that. And so if there's one thing I could urge each and every one of you as you uh, go through the conference and, and go back to what you're doing on your everyday lives is try to see ways in which you can communicate the importance of what you're finding in real terms, in human terms. I think people maybe are getting a better idea of how complicated it all is as we go through this coronavirus uh, pandemic, as they're looking for relief through a um, vaccine and beginning to understand it's not going to come all at once, that there's a process that must be followed, that they're going to be stutter starts, and that's okay. And I think that's probably the biggest message. It's okay when we don't get it all at once. But you have to help us with that. Uh, not me anymore. I'm out of it. But it's important that people understand that science is critical, that the environment is a very much a part of that, Science is informing our decisions on the environment to protect human health and the, and the ecosystem in general, and that we are doing the best we can, constantly improving. And that's the best that we can all, for which we can all strive is constant improvement. So again, thank you very much for all that you have done and are doing, and I trust you're going to have a very successful, fruitful, and, and satisfying conference. Thank you.